Hey everyone, Mr. Happy here and back with another Strangers of Paradise video already. In this one, I want to do something I generally discourage, but I just can't help myself. I want to present to you a bit of a tinfoil hat theory on the game's true plot, which I think they may be covering up. It's actually a theory I had heard on the internet back when Demo 2 came out, and it was one that I shut down, it was a bit of a stretch, but kinda on that theory train a bit myself at this point. Now before we go any further, I'm gonna be doing a lot of Final Fantasy referencing in this video. Of course Final Fantasy 1 is gonna be spoiled, and if I'm right about this, then Strangers of Paradise is technically also gonna be spoiled. But we're gonna be referencing 3, 5, 11, 14, all sorts of Final Fantasy things. So if you just don't play a lot of Final Fantasy games, you don't want a random spoiler, that's what this warning is for. But if you're here to nerd out like I am, then just strap in and let's get to it. Now, if you've been following the game's development and all the promotional material, this might seem a little bit weird, but I'm sure you've noticed that the marketing strategy from Square Enix has shifted a lot. Originally, they painted it as a game using Final Fantasy 1's world as a motif, until pretty much everyone figured out that the protagonist, Jack, seemed to be trending towards becoming Final Fantasy 1's antagonist, Garland. Nomura just ended up admitting it because we figured it out, and then they changed their strategy to market more around this revelation to get Final Fantasy fans a little bit more hooked in, and then they could also focus on the game's other core strengths, its gameplay, content, features, things that, you know, we actually care about in a game as well. However, they couldn't stop themselves from just trying to stir up some mysteries all the same, and they went through multiple routes to do this. Now, a lot of the more recent promotional material focuses heavily on the Lufenians. They were a race of people from the original Final Fantasy who passed down memories through the generations and were investigating the Four Fiends and the Chaos Shrine. They speak their own language and was only understood by handing in the Rosetta Stone as part of a side quest to learn how to speak with them. So being able to naturally communicate with them is not something very many people can do. One of their ancestors, Sid of the Lufane, is also credited with the creating the world's first airship, though this only happens in some of the re-releases of the game. We'll come back to that a bit later. Now, it seems like the Lufenians are the ones propelling the game's events forward, being the ones who give Jack and his companions their crystals and send them on their way. Interviews have also heavily implied that Jack and his company are indeed Lufenian themselves, explaining that their use of the advanced technology, such as cell phones, those are just devices that are normal in Lufenian civilizations, so of course they would have them, even if it seems a bit out of place. It would seem that the Lufenians are investigating chaos just as they were in Final Fantasy 1, but at a much earlier point in their research, and will send Jack down the path that leads him to becoming chaos itself. Heck, it's even stated in the Chaos Shrine's description that it seems to be sent from the future, so it's likely something the Lufenians can actually do, which even explains why Jack and the Four Fiends would be able to send each other backward and forward through time to create the loop from Final Fantasy 1 in the first place. Now that is supposed to be what the title, Stranger of Paradise Final Fantasy Origin, leans into. On top of Paradise possibly being a reference to Chaos' design, being based on John Milton's depiction of Satan in Paradise Lost, it's also the origin story of the original Final Fantasy villain. It's easy enough to take that at face value and move on, think of it no more, wait till the game comes out. But over the months, there have been many clues and whispers and reveals that all lead to another potential outcome, something that is right in front of us, but only if we look hard enough. See, I don't think Final Fantasy Origin is just about the origin of the original game. No, I think it's the origin of the Final Fantasy multiverse. All the various worlds are interconnected by a number of alternate dimensions already, the Interdimensional Rift, the Void, and World B. I think that by the end of this game, we'll see Final Fantasy 1's world destroyed, shattered, and pieces of it sent across the multiverse, formally connecting and forming all of these worlds. It would be fitting given that Final Fantasy 1, of course, launched the franchise, but it's also not something that's that far-fetched if you've been paying attention to the different elements of the franchise as a whole. Still, like I said, it's a big tinfoil hat theory, so I'll need to explain. Now, this theory actually began back when Demo Number 2 was released. Someone had proposed it in my Twitch chat, and I had seen whispers of it online as well. After we figured out from demo number one that Jack was probably going to become Garland, we instead shifted our focus to the new demo in front of us, the environments, the gameplay, the good stuff. Many took notice, myself included, 
that the Refrain wetlands had many striking similarities with the sunleft waterscape of Final Fantasy XIII. The music, the environmental layout, and the weather-related gameplay mechanics, they were just all really similar. Some immediately started proposing a multiverse theory, but I saw it as just an homage, you know, a way for them to draw from experience and create new environments. Final Fantasy 1 is not a super diverse world. It's the first of the franchise built 35 years ago, and so it's mostly caves and open areas with some forests. You know, they need to put something interesting in it. So this is what they did. Fine, done, moving on. Well, that would have been the case if they hadn't done this another five or six times. Then we got to look at the Provoca Seagrot, which is the home of the pirate Bic. Now in the original Final Fantasy, we fought him in the town of Provoca itself and then commandeered his ship because he was a coward that went, whoa, okay, no, you can have my ship, it's fine. But here we have a Seagrot that is eerily similar to Final Fantasy XIV's Sastasha Seagrot. I took notice, but hey, you know, a Seagrot is a Seagrot. It's not like it's gonna look massively different all of a sudden, right? Okay, well, how about the Crystal Mirage? This was a large crystal structure, kind of reminiscent of the Crystal Tower from Final Fantasy III. Okay, cool, liking all the reference here, totally not convinced on the theory. Sunken Shrine, uh, that totally looks like a Mako reactor from Final Fantasy VII. The Wicked Arbor kind of reminds me of the Petrified Forest from Final Fantasy IX. I'm sweating at this point. Then I see the cavern of Earth, and I'm like, hey, that's Wraithwall's tomb from Final Fantasy XII. Uh, nope, 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 you're not going to convince me. Nope. The big image that took me over the edge was of the Ancient's Tower. This tower is described as otherworldly and mysterious, and it is a carbon copy of Final Fantasy XI's Delkfoot Tower. Like, it's eerily similar. Now, in that game, Delkfoot and a number of other similar-looking structures were built by an ancient people named the Xylar, and to a lesser extent, the Kulu, basically Xylarts without as many gifts. In that game, Delkfoot Tower was built as a means to channel the world's mother crystals to open a gate to paradise, opening the pathway to another realm that the Prince Eildnark saw in a vision. Yeah, you see where I'm going with this, don't you? Delkva Tower focused this energy into the floating capital of Tulia, which would then act as the gate, but the plan was sabotaged by the Kulu people as a means of rebelling against the Xylart. This wiped most of them out in an event called the Meltdown, and shattered that world and its people into but fragments of their former selves. Now, if it's just being used as a motif, it is a very fitting one. Jack and his allies' crystals will likely be used here to open a dimensional rift that leads to Jack's more direct encounter with Chaos, which is already mildly depicted in one of the trailers. However, successfully opening the gate could also be an event that shatters Final Fantasy I's world into several fragments, each becoming their own dimension and world that must deal with the consequences of the explosion of Chaos's power. Yeah, I know. It sounds like Final Fantasy XI. It sounds like Final Fantasy XIV. But hey, at this point I consider it a Final Fantasy cliché. So yes, not only do I think that Delkfoot's tower will be used in a similar fashion to Final Fantasy XI's, I do also think that the tower itself is going to be transported to Final Fantasy XI's universe, or is going to be the piece of Final Fantasy I's world that kind of creates the core of what turns Final Fantasy XI's Vanadiel into what it is. However, that's not really where the theory ends, even though I could totally end it there and be completely content. Now, depending on what you consider canon or not, there is one more thing that supports this being the creation of the Final Fantasy multiverse. Now, Chaos is actually the god of discord in the Dissidia franchise. While this Chaos is not actually the Chaos that Garland becomes, it's likely the force that leads to Garland's eventual fall from grace. This Chaos, however, was actually created by Sid of the Lufane, alongside the Onrak peoples from a town in Final Fantasy I, as a means of waging war on the rest of the world. When Sid and a copy of his mother, Cosmos, attempted to free him from Onrak, Cosmos was shot. This caused Chaos to open an interdimensional rift that pulled the three of them into it and into the world in which Dissidia's games take place, World B. Now, Shinryu is actually the master of this space, shouldn't be a surprise to anybody, and Sid convinces him to let Chaos and Cosmos war until Chaos gains enough strength to take the three of them home. This conflict is working over time, trapped in 13 cycles of war, while Chaos gradually loses his memories without the Lufenian ritual to preserve them. 
Garland even reveals to him in the final cycle before he is permanently defeated that this chaos set the events of Final Fantasy 1 in motion, sending Garland back in time initially to start the time loop. That lines up with the direction Final Fantasy Origin seems to be taking and the shattered worlds that Chaos is connecting holding pieces from the very world he left behind. Another interesting tie-in is actually Shinryu. Now, as we said, he's the master of the Dissidia world and seems to be all the rifts between dimensions overall, with the war effectively being his entertainment. Eventually, that's not enough for him, but that's besides the point. We know that one of Final Fantasy Origin's DLCs is actually called Wanderer of the Rift. Now, while this would normally be tied into Gilgamesh, it's possible that they will take this opportunity to establish a timeline with the events of the Dissidia games, in which Gilgamesh does appear. This is even more fitting when you consider that a division of Team Ninja worked on Dissidia NT, and currently develops the awesome mobile game, Dissidia Final Fantasy Opera Omnia. It all just makes sense weirdly enough. But at the end of the day, Will it probably just be a bunch of motifs converged on the first Final Fantasy world with no interdimensional tie-ins or origin stories other than Garland himself? Yeah, probably. And it'll be just fine for that. But the implications we could see, or maybe will see, they'd be awesome too. So I think I'll just enjoy it either way. Anyway, let me know what you think of this theory. I don't often do game theories when it comes to stuff because, quite frankly, I just like to experience things as they happen. But this was on my mind, and you know what? It's my YouTube channel. I'll make the video if I damn well want to. But thanks for watching. Be sure to like, favorite, subscribe, and share. Let me know what you think in the comment section of the video below, and I'll see you in the next one. Until then, take care.